Did you hear that? What? You didn't hear that? I swear to God, I just heard a silo crash over there. You didn't hear that? No. It didn't. Oh, okay. So um, before we get started, I want to thank the TSIA Industry Insight Team. Um, they are a group that we have that help us create content, and JB and I obviously cannot attend all the sessions, but they spread out and they could do that. And we had a huddle here today at lunchtime, and they shared a lot of the insights and themes that they heard, and we, we brought that in here. So if you folks could stand up here and just thank you so much for covering the conference here for us. Um, and so we're going to take these one at a time and and just talk about them. And the first one, I, you know, I put this on the table when we were talking at lunch. It's not lovely out there. And, you know, we've done a lot of these conferences, and typically my experience is I will, I will you know, bump into folks in the hallway, and you bump into one company, and they've got a lot of angst. Maybe they're working on an as-a-service transformation, whatever. You bump into the next company, and they're really super excited right now, and they're growing, and they have a completely different set of issues, but it's a, it's a mixed bag. I, I would say this is probably the first conference I've ever been to where every company I talked to, there was angst. It is, it is tough because still of as a service transformation. It is tough because of the economy. It is tough because of the geopolitical environment and the new regulations and things that's being created there. It is tough with customers, um, we, were, we had a healthcare, healthcare technology board meeting yesterday afternoon, and they were describing the fact that they have customers that have more requirements, you know, host my data in my country, do this, do that, um, but I'm not gonna pay you any more money. So there's just incredible pressure there. So uh, yeah, I, I just think this, it's not lovely right now. I'd, I'd be curious what your... Yeah, and you know, um, you know I, I, my very first slide and my opening keynote was that inane comment about, you know, SAS is largely figured out. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody in this room could believe that that's true. And, you know, what we're, we're going to be talking about, you know, in this session and everything you've heard this week, just how much works is in front of us. I mean, there's a lot of work in front of us. And again, you know, we're not growing the way we used to. You know, the companies have got, you know, a lot going on. And so I, what that guy said is untrue. And let me just read you some truth. So um, I got an email last week in New York. There's a, a summit a, a called PE Back. It's a one of the biggest private equity summits, so it's all the private equity firms. And, uh, and I read a summary of, of, the, of the week, and I just want to give you a, a few points, because many of you, you know, are private equity-backed um, companies. One topic ruled them all, the struggle to dismount. Holding periods are now entering six, seven, eight years. If you sold at a, if, the, if they bought you at a peak valuation, the holding period is now 10 years. The PE industry is not going to recover for at least four to six years. And I, I say that because, um, you know, th there's a, you know, there's an elephant in the room um, that, you know, is, is super real, which is that there are a lot of executives um, at all kinds of different companies who don't say out loud but think to themselves, I'm going to get out of this before I have to go do a lot of these hard, before we have to go do all these hard things. We're going to have an exit, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. I'm going to, maybe I'm going to retire, I don't know. But but there are a lot of people who don't want to get in the hard game, but they still think they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, you know, there you have it, right? Most of, of our companies, if, if they were purchased by private equity, uh, they were purchased at a, at a premium price. And, you know, if the holding period is 10 years, no. um, you know, you, you, you can't, just say, I'm going to ride the old ways out, yep. you're not going to make it 10 years. So, you know, we don't, 
you know, we don't talk enough about like the, sort of the, you know, elephant in the room motivations, right? The things that, you know, nobody wants to say out loud, but that's a real one, yeah. right? I mean, you, yeah, you, no you know that, that is a super yeah. real one. And, you know, and it is, it's n no longer an, an option in my view, or just certainly for, for most companies, it is not an option for the senior executives to say, uh, we're just gonna move slowly on some of these things and not rock the boat and whatever because you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have our event yeah. you know, before I, I need, and somebody else can, the next guy can worry about this. Yeah, it, you know, and just to build on it, you know, I used to have a slide that I would use with executive briefings that had a list of member companies, mostly software companies, that had been acquired, taken private, what year, and the fact that they were still not public. And every one of those companies had the same press release. This is a great opportunity. We see nothing but potential for future growth. And they all expected to be back out in the market in about three years, which is a standard playbook. So this is, that's not, you know, this has been unfolding for quite a while. And, and the only good part about it's not lovely in my mind, because a lot of people, the most common question I got here, you know, is, gosh, you know, we are stuck on this. And, you know, and, and what, what gets executive teams to lean in? And it's pain. Pain gets executive teams to lean in. And so the only upside of it's not lovely is this forcing function you're talking about. We can't really ignore the fact that we have to do some of the heavy lifting on our business models. We have to do something different here and how we're how we're operating. Um, but I want to put this next one on the table, which this was, was, was yours. Uh, we've gone from well-managed to over-managed. What's your, what's your you know, observation from the conference on that? Um, that we have, um, you know, somebody, somebody uh, I, I was meeting with a group of Microsoft, Microsoft folks today, and somebody was making the observation that, you know, very often, um, you know, the, the CEO has the right narrative and the individual contributors are motivated to pursue that narrative. Um, and then there's these layers of management in the middle that sort of prevent them from doing that. And are you talking about the people in this room here? Or who are you talking uh, to? <laughs> listen, these are the enlightened ones that are here. The problem is the people that are at these companies that are not here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so we have metric, KPI'd, siloed, you know, managed the living shit out of these businesses, and um, and it is made, you know, it is made everybody, you know, too often stuck in a box. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, you know, it, it's, it's so complicated, it's so uh, uh, rigorous and confined and managed that it's super difficult to change. And I think there's a difference between well-managed and over-managed. And I think we have, we, we took the concept of well-managed and drew it into a state of overmanaged. And now I think, you know, I, I heard a lot of people talking and in a lot of sessions, what I would say is we gotta move back a little bit. We gotta, we gotta break down some of these structures. We've gotta let people make decisions. We have to crowdsource, we have to, you know, uh, uh, collaborate, we have to do all these things that these strict structures frustrate. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, part of we were talking about, you know, all the KPIs that can be in play and people are focused on optimizing their world and their, you know, KPIs and, and don't really care about what's going on. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, the book that Lou Gerstner wrote when he came into IBM, I think it's called Yes, Elephants Can Dance. But uh, the great story from that book is IBM was hemorrhaging 
I mean, very, very close to going bankrupt. And he brought all these business unit, all these managers in, right? And one by one. And he goes, everyone would come in and tell me how great, they'd show me their KPIs in a sense, how great my business is doing, right? And, and we're going to be great next quarter. And, and then he brought them all together then after individually interviewing them. He said, I heard from all of you, your businesses are all fantastic. You're all hitting your KPIs. Why are we about to go broke? And I feel that that's what you're on here, right? We, we, we've just segmented this thing so much that we can't see the forest. You know, yeah, I mean, trees. we're, you know, instead of being, you know, just if you, if, if you, if you talk, look at the whole company in general, um, I would say, you know, we, we use all these expressions like customer-centric and customer-focused and what, whatever. And th that's really, I mean, yeah, okay. Um, that's, that's great. The truth is, we operate from the inside out, mm -hmm. right? We have our metrics, we have our organizations, our P&Ls and whatever, and we're like heads down on those things. And, um, you know, we're, they've triumphed in many respects. They've triumphed over the customer, mm -hmm. yeah. these things. And, um, and I, 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 I predict that um, these silos and a lot of these things that we use today, these command and control systems, are going to look super archaic super fast. And I think AI is going to accelerate that. We're going to talk more about that. I think, I think in just five years, organizations are going to be much flatter, mm -hmm. much wider, much more cross-functional. Um, and, and so, I mean, you, you just, the definite, if, if well managed means tightly managed, we've overdone it. Yeah. And, I, you know, to, to chip on that customer centric, because I, I do believe that, you know, the companies in this room here and all the members that, you know, I work with, that they are committed to their customers, right? I mean, you can't be around yeah, if sure. you're not. They're, you're, you're committed, but. But I completely on board your point that it's it's really we don't when we say customer centric, it's really not where the lens it needs to be. We care about our customers, but then we start by operating the way we want to operate. And and often when a company says to me, it's like, well, Thomas, one of our biggest competitive advantages is we are so customer centric. And then I'll say, okay, so what does that mean? Like, give me, you know, and as soon as you start to click into that, it kind of falls apart because obviously there's a lot of things they're doing which are not optimized, you know, for the customer. It's optimized for the way they want to operate. Yeah, I mean, what percentage of the metrics of the KPIs are about the customers versus yeah. what percentage are about the silos? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, a topic that came up in our board meeting, it came up in a, a, an executive session we did, it, it kept coming up again and again and again, is data. Our data is a mess. I've, I've, I've given you that observation. I hear that so much in these executive briefings. But, you know, you and I were, were talking about this, and we were talking about this at lunch with, with the Industry Insights team, because they heard it in, you know, volume as well. You know, it can't be the problem. We can't just point to that and say, gosh, our data's so messed up. I can't do all these important and cool things you guys are talking about at TSIA. That's, that's a non-starter. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, if, if you're waiting for the day when all of your data is perfectly clean and all of the systems are talking to each other and, you know, you go on and on and on and on, you know that day's never going to come. It's just never going to come. And so, and so to use that, to point at that and say, well, that's the problem and we can't do X, Y, or Z until we fix that problem, yeah. you know, you're dead in the water, yeah. right? And so, you know, I, I mean, in, in some respects, you know, geez, start over. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, pick, go through and cherry pick. You know, first of all, I was making this comment, you know, if you just went back a couple of years, you know, the, the, the discussion around the, quote, data problem was that, like, I can't get this system to talk to this system. I can't get, you know, my Salesforce implementation to talk to my whatever it is. 
And I think, you know, n now, I mean, I think we're all thinking differently about the problem. We're, we're, thinking, we're thinking, where's the good data? Where's the data that we need? Let's get it the hell out of these systems. Let's get it someplace we can work with it. Let's do what, you know, the work we need to do, the analysis we need to do, run the plays we need to run, and then take that and put it back in those systems. Yeah. Right? And, and if, it, if it isn't perfect, do the best with whatever you've, you've got. Um, uh, you know, I, I was making an analogy backstage about, you know, and I'm going to talk about this more in a second, but the, about like, you know, when you go down the grocery aisle with your cart, you know, you look over here and you go, okay, I want one of those, and I want two of those, and I want one of those, and, you know, and, and really, um, it's, you know, going data shopping, going data shopping should become like one of, one of the most important things you do, right? So, first of all, in order for that to happen, there has to be data on the shelf. And so, you know, it's, you know, and, and you only want to put out the stuff that's going to sell. You don't want to stock the shelves with things that aren't going to sell. And so, you know, that's what merchandising is all about, right? That you have to figure out, anticipate the demand of, of the consumer and put those things that you think they're going to want on the shelf. And so, if you would look at your own data, if your own data, and you say, what are the other, what data do I have that the other parts of the company might be interested in, mm -hmm. right? If everybody did that exercise and you created a, a grocery aisle, right? And then you had every other organization go down the aisle. Now, you can't buy, you know, you can't buy um, a, a, an automobile at the grocery store, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so, you know, r realistically, you know, you're not going to have every piece of data to solve every problem in the world. But you have some data that you think might be useful to the other parts of the company. We got to wait. Each one of our silos has to identify that data, and then we have to let the other people go shopping in our data, and we have to go shopping in their data. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you only put the good stuff out. You only put the stuff that's decent, that's clean, that you think is going to be useful, and then everybody goes shopping, and that tells you what needs to go in the data lake. Yeah. Right? And, and so we, we can't sit around and say, Nothing can be done or we can't do very much because we have a data problem. If you define fixing the data problem as perfect data, that's never going to happen. Yeah, I agree. And one thing I wanted to put on the table that the Industry Insights team was telling us in one of the sessions, and I thought this was an interesting conversation we had, and that is that, so the thing with data, we get data and then let's say we start to get it better, we start to get it more centralized, and then the next you know, moving the rat down the snake is, oh, we got to get people to use the data. And, and they were in a session where people were like, oh, we create these great dashboards, and maybe they're dashboards for sales, and sales doesn't use them, or maybe it's for whoever, you know, and uh, the support, they don't use it. It's so frustrating. But this world where it's not going to be a world of dashboards and forcing people to go there and understand what's, what am I supposed to do with this data, this is where AI is going to be a massive game changer. It's not going to be, hey, salesperson, go to that dashboard and figure out how to use that data. AI is going to run on that data, and the salesperson is going to wake up in the morning, and the AI is going to say, this is what you're doing today. <laughs> this is who you should be talking to, right? That, that is, I think, going to change everybody's workflow, not just sales, services. And that's a game changer because that is one of the tough things is getting people to be data-driven. And we're going to just leapfrog that problem, I think. So it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, oh, yeah, just, to, I mean, you know, and, and I, I also said earlier, like, you know, you run a play, you, you run a play, data tell, tells you to run a play. Don't forget to go back and tell the AI whether the play worked. Right, so you, right? the data gets better. And, and so I agree with you. I, I think dashboards, you know, dashboards were, uh, you know, a, a, an improvement. Sure. Because you went from, I got to spend time on this much data to I got to spend time on that much data. But even that much data is spending time on that people weren't doing it. Right. So now you have the AI spend the time, come up with the recommendations, you, you, you look at the recommendations, you either do them or you don't do them. You, if you do them, you say this worked or it didn't work. If you don't do it, you, you say why. You go look at the, the underlying data and you say, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that, here's why. But after a while, you, you, you can stop yeah. 
be, you know, and so I think, um, I, I do think that, that AI is going to allow this sort of quantum leap mm -hmm. in efficiency I in do. terms of creating data-driven employees all throughout the organization. Yeah, I do. I think it's, I think that's, it's a, an important thought as you're thinking about how these tools change, you know, that whole, that whole, uh, 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 consumption of data. So this, this next one, culture can't be the problem. And I think you put this on the table because, and I, and I hear this quite a bit as well, is you have people that are very frustrated and they're like, we're not moving and we, you know, we don't have an appetite for change or we're, you know, we have a culture of dot, dot, dot. And, and so that is another, just like our data's broke, we can't do anything. Our culture's just not, you know, this is just not who we are. So, w w what are your sentiments on this? Uh, first of all, I mean, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I've got Jessica's framework, and you know, like, yeah, yeah I thought it was very edged yeah, in spot my on brain. Um, I, I, I agree. Again, you, you can't you can't point at the culture of the company and say the culture of the company is ho holding my organization or whatever back. Um, and and so I, I have an idea, mm -hmm. <laughs> good idea, bad idea, I don't know. But if I, you know, if I was going to try to get a well-established culture to change, um, I would, um, I would add uh, a few words onto the end of uh, every evaluation of every decision that the company has to make. And those few words would be, what would the customer think of that decision? What would the customer think of that decision? And because I, as I said before, I think unfortunately we're operating from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And by the time the way we operate gets out to the customer, it just doesn't make any sense in the world to the customer. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's like, man, why do you, customers are like, why do you make me do this? Right? Well, it's because we had to do this, we had to do this. Think about a world where every decision from big to little, every manager or whoever's making that decision had to be prepared to come into a room and defend the question, what do you think the customers would think of that? And if, if, that, if that became part of the DNA, like, you don't go in and build a business case or make a decision without, because somebody's going to come up and ask you, what do you think the customer would think of that? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, because we do have to be, you know, again, we say we're customer-centric, but we don't do nearly enough with the customer at the forefront of the decision. And this would at least, at least make every manager on every decision be conscious and aware that the, that the right decision should be understandable by the customer. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, you know, it's back to the drawing boards. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm listening to you. I, I have a great idea. We got to make, do you remember the old, what would Jesus do? Uh, you know, things he'd wear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to get a good acronym. You yeah, got to yeah. get a band. Everybody would wear these. And before they make a decision, you go, wait a minute, what would the customer think? Yeah, I think, yeah, right. I think that's, that's a game plan right there. So another thing that our industry insights team put on the table was this, this strain around collaboration. And again, we're here talking about how do you bust silos, and so you're trying to build collaboration across groups. And one of the, the key insights that they took away from, from some of the presentations is that collaboration just doesn't magically happen. Nobody had a story of, you know, we agreed that we have to work better between, you know, product and services, right? So we just, you know, we just leaned into that and it happened. It is something that you have to absolutely reinforce with, you know, either metrics, with compensation, with process. We are with going culture. To, and culture. Yeah. But you have to put that scaffolding uh, around it. It, is, it doesn't happen by osmosis. So these silos are not going to basically collapse because we all agree that it's a really good idea. Yeah. We have to yeah, systematically... And one, one, of, one of their other uh, you know, sort of conclusions, which I thought was super interesting. Um, and, and I'm, well, actually, I'm going to do a little show of hands here. H how many of you would um, answer the following question in the affirmative? Um, I have a really good understanding of what all the other silos in my company do and how they do it. 
Curious. Is it Z? Okay. I got a hand right One. here. That's cool. That's cool. Right. And we you're a startup. No, I'm just kidding. We got two. <laughs> we got two. I, I, I mean, yeah. you know, so, so what's, we, we've all heard the word collaboration 10 million times this week, right? And it's true. It's absolutely true. But, you know, one of the observations was, you know, one of the reasons why collaboration isn't happening more is that people are so heads down on their silo and stuck in their silo, they don't know what the other organizations do, how they do it, what they can do for us, can't do for us, what we can do for them, we can't do for them. And, and so, you know, it's like, I don't know when to hit, hit the collaboration button, mm -hmm. right? You could build a button that said collaborate. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm not sure people would know yeah. when to hit it. Yeah, right. Yep. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that, that's kind of a, a, a crazy thought, but it's probably true. true. And, and so, you know, not only do you have to, do you have to um, I'll, I'll use the word ensure, ensure that collaboration happens, I, I think just starting at this basic level of, you know, who are the adjacent silos um, what do they do, why do they do it, and how do they do it, mm -hmm. and how do they affect us, and how do we affect them? Mm -hmm. And just creating that awareness, um, you know, it, up top and bottom in the team mm -hmm. is a hell of a great place to start, right? Yeah, it is. And, I, you know, so in our brainstorming session there, this concept of transparency, that, that you know, if, if other departments are black boxes and stuff just kind of goes in and gets spit back out, <laughs> but you don't really know, it's harder, to your, to your point, to effectively collaborate. And we have a, a relatively new marketing leader, and she was making this point. And she says, hey, as somebody new to this company and trying to be the best, you have the best marketing organization that we can, it is super helpful to really understand what the research team is doing and what, you know, and that transparency makes me better in my job. And I think that there's so much truth to that observation and that's something, you know, that we got to lean into. Um, this next one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it up here before I put it on the table. So, you, you know, we have spent a lot of time on as a service transformation with companies, right? And that is usually a multi-year journey. Um, and when people ask, you know, how do you organize for that? Because uh, you usually need to do some org structure changes. Uh, Jeff Moore has a great book called Zone to Win, which I always recommend um, on how to specifically organize for a big, big business model transformation. And his argument is the book is, is that, look, look, man, business transformation is something that might happen once in a career. I mean, a real, you know, like as a service transformation for legacy tech companies, for many of you, you've probably sat there if you're in the middle of it or you got through it or you have to start it, and you're saying, oh my God, this hill is so steep, but thank God. I mean, it's probably once in my lifetime I got to go through something this disruptive. This is the observation that we came up with from all the sessions, which is a little daunting. And you, what was the string you, we had as a service? So, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was saying, that the length of the sentence that describes our transformations is getting longer and longer and longer and longer. It used to be we have to transform to a subscription business model. Mm -hmm. And then it was we have to transform to a, a, a subscription business model with a digital customer experience. And now it's we have to transform to a subscription business model with a digital customer experience that's AI enabled. Mm -hmm. Now it's, uh, then it's going to be, we have to transform to a uh, subscription business model with a digital customer experience that's AI uh, uh, enabled yeah, yeah. and is quantum computing proof. <laughs> proof. <laughs> right. right. I mean, th these yeah. things are, uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we had, we asked Brian Belmont to come and talk. These things are, these, quote, transformations are queuing up. Yes. Gaboom, gaboom, yeah. gaboom, gaboom. And, and, and they're never going to end. And the, the rate that they're queuing up yeah. is, is accelerating. And so, um, you know, one of, one of, you know, my, you know, big, big questions in my mind um, it, or, you know, s statements I would make is, is, is um, the ability to change, the ability of big companies to change is, is, 
going to become one of, if not the most important corporate capabilities that in, that, that in the firm. And, and so, so, are we good at changing? Do we know how to manage change? Do we know how to incent change? Do we know how to measure change? No. Is, it, is it, you know, centralized? Is it decentralized? You know, is it a small team, a big team? You know, but, but you know, you, you have to ask yourselves, how, really, how good at, is our company at change in a world where transformation is never ending. Is never ending. Well, and, and again, transformation, because I think this is an important point, is that we, you know, we're talking about every one of these transformations is forcing a business model transformation. And that is what is so hard. That's what was, has been so hard for a traditional tech company to go to as a service, is it's a fundamental business model transformation. You know, when AI gets plopped into your business, it's going to be, end up being a business model transformation. When the next thing it comes down here, and as I'm listening to you, a lot of you, I'm sure, can remember the days when your company maybe decided, hey, we're going to grow more through merger and acquisition. So maybe you, you know, you're an EMC, you're a Cisco, you're an Oracle. And at the beginning of that journey, companies, you know, you suck at acquisition, right? The, you buy somebody, it's, you know, it's terrible. By the end, it is a playbook. You know how to, and, I, and what you're describing, you need that same level of muscle and capability to say, we can run a business model transformation every X amount of years, and we have the playbook, and we can rinse and repeat. That's the level of yeah, capability and, we're talking and, here. You know, um, as everyone in this room can attest, um, just because the CEO told the analyst that we have transformed, yeah. it doesn't mean we have... Right. Done anything. Right. Right. Yeah. The latest version of that is AI. Right. right. I mean, I mean, every CEO in the world in the last four quarters has spun up an AI story. Yeah. Right. With varying degrees of truth. Right. Yeah. Same thing was happening when we were pivoting from, you know, license to subscription, and they would take the maintenance revenue and reclass it and say, oh, we're a recurring revenue business, right? right? Nothing changed but the reclassing of the revenue, right? right? So, so, so this is, you know, this ability to change, and there are companies, you know, you've heard this analysis of, of you know, how many of the Fortune 500 of 1960 are still there, and it's like 10% right. or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that was much, those were much slower, less frequent transformations, right. less need to change. Now it's picking up faster, 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 faster. And at the same time, the holding periods right. on these PE-backed companies, the, right. the, the horizon's getting further away and further yeah. away, not closer, yeah. closer, closer, further away. Yeah. And so you, you, you put all that together, and to your point, like how... How in shape are we around to our change it, it, muscles? You know? Yeah, and it's such a top to bottom because another thing that, that I, one of the meetings I was in, we were talking about some of these challenges, and they said, well, you, you know, it goes back to the financial fish. Um, well, our board will never tolerate, you know, a decrease in margins, right? This is, and I think the boards, the executives, and all employees have to be in, you know, the shape to say this is the new way we have to operate. And so, we, we, you know, our margin profile may go like this all the time because we're going through these transformations. Completely different mindset. And, and which leads to this next one that I, I put on the, the table here is the fact that I did hear several people came up to me personally and they said, you know, our executive team, we are just not aligned on this. We're not aligned on what as a service is. We're not aligned on what AI is going to mean. We're not, we are, you know, we're, we're speaking different languages. And people want to know, you know, where do companies start? How do I get them off this point? And, you know, my assertion is, is baselining executive teams on common vernacular and understanding is key. It's one of the things we do for a living, but that is to me always job one. Because if you get in there and the CFO has one vision of what as a service or AI or whatever it is, and the CFO has a different one and head of product has a different one, you're going nowhere. 
you were going nowhere at highway to speed. So I would say, you know, job number one is they're at least, they may not all agree yet on what the first moves are going to be, but if they don't have a common frame, you're screwed. That's my observation. Yeah, so, so I'll do it. I'm going to do a shameless plug uh, poll if I can. So let me just ask a question. How many of you feel more aligned with your coworkers who attend the TSIA conferences than those who don't attend <laughs> TSIA conferences? Okay. There's a lot of hands. There we go. Yep. Yeah. No. Virtually everyone. No. It's, it's because we, we have together, we have developed a lexicon. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, we, we know what layer, we all know what layer is and now a player is. We, we know what the fish is, we know. So we, we're, we, we have these frameworks in our head, we have these experiences of meeting with other companies who are sh living the same frameworks and journeys and, and use the same language and, and all those things. And then you get to these executives that, you know, to be quite frank, where the hell are they? Mm -hmm. Why aren't they here? You know, because we know the power that this community brings things and people into alignment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, 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 you know, hey, part of it is, you know, part of it may be what I said, which is the elephant in the room, is that, you know, in some of these senior leadership people, there may be people that are motivated personally motivated not to change, not to take right. risks. You know, they, they want to put lipstick on the pig. Right. Yeah, la, la, la. yeah, yeah, as long, <laughs> as, long as they can. Yeah. Um, but, but again, you know, if the, if the pace of change is picking up um, and, and the, you know, the, the time till your options are, you know, liquid at a great price is, is not in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, you just you can't stay that way. You can't stay in the old way anymore. And the, and the other thing is, I, I think, and I, you know, sort of heard this a lot today, and AI is going to be a huge accelerant of this. You're going to be able to fall behind faster than you ever have before. Yeah. You're going to be able to fall behind faster than you ever have before. Um, and, you know, and just look at cost structures. If, if, you know, if two companies in an industry, one company rapidly breaks down silos, get rid, gets rid of all those duplicated costs, you know, solves the data problem, solves the culture problem, um, implements AI at scale, and all of a sudden their margins are going, you know, like this, and their costs are going like this, and the, the other company who's in the same market isn't doing those things, you know, whose stock would you rather own, mm -hmm. right? And, and so those side-by-side -side comparisons, um, it's going to be super easy to fall behind. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it could be, again, on the, on the growth side, it could be on the margin side, it could on the, be on the EBITDA side. It could be losing employees to those other companies. Yep. You know, I, I put a question in the queue today that didn't, didn't make it up, up there, which is, um, um, when is it okay to quit? Mm-hmm. When is it okay to quit? Like, you know, if, if your leadership team is not aligned and you're just banging your head on the desk, right, when is it okay to quit and say, these guys, they're just not going to do it, no. you know? And then here's somebody over here who is, you know, really on it, right? I mean, so, I mean, so yeah, the ability it, to fall behind is going to be easier and faster than ever at any time in history. Yeah, and on the quitting part, and I said this on the opening day, and this is true, there are only two types of management teams that I interact with now. And there are ones that are chipping on it. Don't have, they don't have to have all the answers, but they are leaning into, I got to do something different. And you have ones that literally have all these reasons why they can't move forward. And I do believe you're working and I challenged you before you left Vegas to really think what type of management team am I working for or am I on? That is a career limiting fact right there in today's world. Um, this is a tactical one, but in a sense, but I, we, you and I wanted to put it on the table because we heard so much about this. We're calling bullshit 
on all these companies are like, oh yeah, we're back, we're going back to the office, and that's that's what we're doing, and we're forcing everybody in. I just read an article yesterday about how occupancy rates are are back to the roof. Everybody we talk to is struggling still with this, and they are struggling with how do I make getting back into the office meaningful. And so if you're still struggling with this, you are in super good company. Um, and I think we're all still navigating what the you know, world is really going to, what the new normal is really going to look like here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you used, you know, we were talking about this at the board meeting. I, I think that's exactly the right word. If you're going to ask people to come to the office, it better be a meaningful experience. Yeah. If, if, if you're telling them to come back and they're going to sit there on Teams meetings all, yeah. all day and their boss isn't there and their coworkers aren't there, you know, I mean, that's just, that's, forget that. Yeah. That day is gone. Yeah. So, so the question is, how do you curate meaningful experiences? Right. Right? And, and, and so, I mean, it, somebody was even saying, well, we, you know, what we're saying is um, every, what was it? Every six months, you have to be in the office 90 days or something like that. But even that, you know, so that, that's designed to be flexible, but it's not designed to be meaningful, yeah. right? So, so, you know, what is the event, the, the, the meeting, the, 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 the discussion, the, you know, whatever it's going to be for that day that's going to make that person being in the office that day a meaningful experience may mean that if, you know, this person is going to come in, then that person has to come in and that person has to come in and that person has to come in. But at least when, when they go home or somebody says, why do you have to go in the office tomorrow? They've got a meaningful answer to that, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, so I think, you know, that, that, is, that is what this is going to come down to. And, and maybe if we create enough of those meaningful experiences, it being, the benefits of being in the office start to stick. Yeah, and, and maybe you, you, but I think we have to earn. That's right. We, as managers and executives, we have to earn um, the desire of the workforce to come back to the office, yeah. not force the yeah, workforce. Yeah, and especially for the youngest generation. Again, I have a, a son who's 29, a software engineer. Um, and, and he works remote, and, but I just know from talking to him and his friends, if you feel you're gonna go, the genie's out of the bottle, if you feel you're gonna go back with that generation of the workforce and say, you have to come into the office just because we want eyes on you, whatever, that they're like, I'm working somewhere else. I mean, yeah, it is he, now. He, he told you that, that it's a job, yes or no, that, oh, yeah, that that's flexibility a yes no, is. That's a yes or no factor. A yes or no thing. And he's not alone in that. So, um, yeah. so I don't think you can get that genie back in the, in the bottle. Yeah. I'm going to go to this, this next one here um, on is AI going to solve all the problems? We heard, uh, we did a breakout conversation. We heard some really good tactics on, you know, how people are deploying AI. I continue to be amazed at how much people has gone. Brian Belmont from Microsoft sat in that session, and he was, and all these ideas were, ideas were flying around, and he was texting, and like, you know, what are you texting? He goes, I'm texting my team. We're not moving fast enough. We're not moving fast enough. And they're, he, they're already doing a lot of stuff, obviously. So um, this is, you know, we know there's going to be a lot of game-changing use cases here, but you were making the comment of, but is, you know, is it's a hammer and is everything really a nail? Yeah, I, I, you know, like when I was growing up, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, like everything that happened to me, my mom always said, did you put alcohol on it? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter what it was. Right, mom. I, twist, I twisted Wait, my what? ankle. I twisted my ankle. Did you put alcohol on it? <laughs> right. and, and and you know and, uh. and and so, you know, um, what is the expression that you know innovations take twice as long and they're twice as impactful, right? Um, I, I think this is is one of those things. I think it could be massively beneficial, will be massively beneficial. But meanwhile, we got all these human beings, we have all of the, the you know, these data issues and culture issues and all those kind of things. And, uh, you know, AI, AI is certain, I mean, we're doing an entire conference on, on AI in your operating model. 
AI, real live case studies of companies who have successfully deployed AI at scale inside their business to, to improve operating results and do all these things. I mean, you know, it, it is going to be, it's going to be the most in-depth, the most actionable, you know, set of content around how you use AI to your advantage um, in Orlando. But, but I can tell you that's still going to be super early, even as fast as we're moving. Yeah. Six months, a year, it's still going to be super, super early. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, I, I don't think that, I just don't think we can say that AI is the new alcohol. It cures every single problem we have. And no matter what you do, you put alcohol on it, yep. put AI on it. Um, <laughs> so I wonder whether that's why I like wine uh, so much. Well, I, it could be. I, I was going to say, when, when I was curious if her advice was put alcohol on it or put alcohol in you. I, well, I wasn't every sure. problem, I always say, here, yeah. have a glass of wine. Oh, okay. So, all right, we're going to move to the Q&A here. And um, the first one here is around what is the most critical silo to bust first? I'm going to take a crack at this. I would argue, and I'm going to tie it back to what you were talking about a few moments ago. I would submit that what you should be looking for is what interface is causing your customer, what organizational interface is causing your customer the most pain right now? Is it the relationship between support and product? Is it a relationship between, you know, sales and PS? Is it, the, you know, where is that interface really causing the, the fact that it, you're not collaborating, you're very siloed in what you're doing, it's crazy, creating the most pain for your customer? I would go after that first. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, would, would you agree that the most, and I think you guys were saying that, that the sort of the most active discussion in the community right now is the convergence of support and CS. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the yeah. most active one. Um, but but so but I agree with you, right? You, you know, find the find the the most broken yeah. you know relationship that that's really having a negative effect on the customer and focus there first. But but again, like I said on on, on Tuesday. Start with a data project. Mm -hmm. S start with what data can I give you that y y will help you understand? What data can you help give me so that I can better understand? Mm -hmm. um, what are the plays that that data can help us drive together? Right? So I really think that that is the prescription. So you pick, you know, again, support and CS may be the first to converge, um, you know, ES and CS, because, uh, you know, again, you know, what is the difference between, you know, what education does and driving adoption, right? So, so, you know, somewhere in this services portfolio, you know, your initial, your initial convergence activities are going to happen. But then the prescription, the playbook you run s starts with a, a data project, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, but I'd also say, the, back to this point that collaboration is just not going to happen. I think if you are truly committed to busting these silos, I think you pick where you want to start, you, I, data's uh, an anchor, and then you have to put scaffolding around it. In other words, you have to say, look, we are going to put process meetings, we are going to sync up on KPIs, but there has to be management you know, scaffolding that we're just not going to say we're going to try to bust a silo. Yep. Both silo leadership has to be committed that we are actually going to put process around this. So, so enforce it until it, you don't need to anymore. Right, exactly. Until it becomes natural. Yeah. Right. So another question that came in here is, is voted up is what's the most surprising question you heard all week? I'll take a first crack at this. And it wasn't a question. Uh, as much as it was an observation or statement. So I was in a meeting and an executive said, you know, we have these customers and because of the current geopolitical environment, because of, you know, new data laws, all this stuff, you know, they're coming to us and giving us, you know, new requirements. Keep the data, you know, in our country. Do this, you know, security-wise, whatever. And they're, and they're asking or telling us we've got to do all these things. Um, and it's more cost on us. And, but they don't expect to pay anymore, okay? So I said, well, you know, obviously, you, you know, you've got more cost here, you gotta raise your price, right? <laughs> and, they, and they said, well, you know, but there's, we have competitors that are gonna come in and offer to do that at no cost. And I do believe that more and more of our markets, 
you know, are becoming very hyper competitive. And for a lot of tech companies out there, you are feeling, you are getting into this box where the customers are asking for more, there's more cost requirements, you don't feel like you have pricing power like you did in the past. That's one thing they, they observed. They said, we, we were able to raise prices for a little while there with inflation. The customers are done with that. Now they're back to, we want discounts. And then I said, well, if all that's true, your margins are obviously going to go down. And they said, well, again, can't tell that to the board. Well, how do you basically round that square? I mean, there, there, there's, there's got to be a release valve there, right? Either, either you don't do these things the customer's asking, not an option, you do them and you charge more, or you figure out efficiencies in a big way, or you take a haircut in, in profits. But there's no magic pixie dust there. And I feel that a lot of tech companies, well, I don't care you know, what space you're in, is feeling that. And I, I, the intensity of that was, was larger than I, I understood you know, going in. Yeah, I, I, I mean, um, I, I think the most surprising question that I got this or, uh, question or statement the, that I heard this week was, um, w we can't agree, this company, we can't agree on the role of customer success. And, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, customer success and managed services are the new kids on the block. Right. I mean, we've been doing support for a long time. We've been doing PS for a long time, um, and, and so it's it was it it was valid. It was valid for companies and us as a community to debate, you know, what CS was and what CS wasn't, and you know, should it be can it be charged for or is it free, you know, and and but it's 2023. And, you know, I mean, we have the data, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and, the, and, and we know, I think we, now the bleeding edge of what customer success could be is, is very exciting and there's a lot more evolution and we're learning a lot more about exactly, you know, how to take, as an example, the, the relationship between the customer and the CSM and do more with it, you know, that equity that's been built up in that, to do more with it without upsetting the customer and all that. So the potential of CS is still evolving. Yeah. But the <clears throat> fact that companies are still debating about, yeah. you know, the fundamental questions yep. that I would argue we've answered, like those ships have yep. sailed. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I don't know, is it like not, is, is you know, are they not whipping out their TSI data to say, yeah. you know, he, here's the facts? Um, so, it, but the, the just, I was super surprised that, that that company was so far back in the early days. Um, and I think, just to build on that, I mean, you know, obviously there are different flavors of CSMs, the types of roles, but it's finite, not infinite, and we know what those flavors look like. We have deep compensation data because different flavors align with, you know, different compensation models. We have information on the charters. So, you know, it's very well framed. You know, it's, it's one of these models that makes probably, you know, sense for you, but it's not like, oh gosh, we just cannot agree on this. That, I agree with you, that, that makes zero sense to me. Um, I'm going to pick a question here. I'm going to put a shameless plug in for Bo DiMuccio. Um, and that is, there's a, there's a question here about, you know, I have this PSO um, at a SaaS company. What's the one thing I could do, right, next year to make things better? What would it be? Um, and I will tell you, in, again, that was one of the surprising questions I had in these exec executive briefings. How do we make PS more profitable? We have all kind of content. But the most important thing, your embedded PS, is if you are confused on your charter, sort of like, what's CS? Like, what are we trying to get out of PS? And the executive team's not aligned on that, then that just is ca causing you constant friction. And so Bo has this awesome workshop on aligning around the charter. And again, it's not infinite amounts of embedded you know, charters here. There's some clear ones, but getting the entire executive team to stack hands on what they want the charter to be is a game changer in terms of your ability to be successful. So and, I, and, and closely related to that, as you may said the other day, is w w what do we want the partners to do? <laughs> there you go. Right. Well, that's part and, of the and charter. Not, yeah. And not go this way for a year, and then that way for two years, right. and then that way for two years. Yeah. Absolutely, I totally agree. The, um, let's see here. Do you see advantages to being a fast follower 
rather than a first mover when implementing um, AI. I'll give you a case, an anecdote here, or not an anecdote, a case study we're working on um, to help answer this. So uh, I interviewed uh, the, the woman who runs uh, education services at OpenText to do a case study on how they are using AI within education services. And she, they were early adopters here with a, with a technology for content creation, and they really helped sort of with, you know, alpha beta versions of this company. They spent a year, year and a half, uh, and now they have, you know, dramatically optimized their costs for generating content, et cetera, et cetera. But she said, you know, that product has matured so much that whoever buys it now, it's out of the box. You know, so, so the, you know, her pioneering work is going to benefit everybody afterwards, right? And so I think the thing that we heard, one of the best practices, in your companies, there should be a center of excellence for evaluating AI tools before you deploy them in the business. Business units may not know the right questions to ask around, is this sort of smoke and mirrors, or is this really have potential? And so I would say, you know, in terms of being a first mover, um, if you're going to be in, in, you know, the framework, if stuff is, you know, just at the water line or just above the water line, it's kind of emerging. I think step one is somebody in your company has to be really good at just understanding is what the story they're pitching makes sense, is it solid, and then we can decide, you know, if we want to if we want to start to move forward with it. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, on well, that? I mean, you know, you, you, being a fast follower. Is is there's going to be a lot of benefits to being a fast yep. follower, yep. Um, and um, because you know the you know what do they say? You can always tell the pioneers because they have arrows in their backs, right? <laughs> and so um, you know it's it, it, but but the fact of the matter is that there's going to be, and I'm using this in lowercase. There's going to be opportunities for IP creation. Yep. There's going to be oper opportunities to do things that give you competitive advantages yep. um, in your particular market and in your particular area that you probably don't want to wait on, right? That you know you're going to go in there and get your feet wet and and you know think aggressively and be a fast follower everywhere else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, and the uh, one final thing I would say is I I predict that one of the places we really 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 have to look and be fast followers of is the B2C companies. Yep, absolutely, I totally agree. Watch what they're doing. Last question we'll take here, it's a great one. How can middle management who attended the conference influence the alignment and collaboration to achieve silo busting at the C-level? So there's an offer that we have on the table here and the best play you can run is to get us in front of your C-suite on this conversation. And we will take that meeting all day long and so they ask you go back and you say, look, we can get TSI executive to come in and talk to our executives about what they're seeing in the industry and some of these key concepts. Um, again, I just did almost 60 of these over the last six months, and it can be a game changer if it's the first time those executives have been exposed to the concepts. And, and we, we believe, again, education and alignment for that C-suite. So, so that offer is on the table, and, and, and the work for you is to get you know get them to agree to that meeting and get your buddies to these conferences not not yeah. not just because they hear from TSIA but they look at everybody else they look at all these other companies and they yeah. go oh my god you know this isn't you know my person who goes to TSIA is coming back and telling me th these things but it sounds like you know it's coming from her yeah right and when they come here and they sit in this audience and they see all these and it's, realize that all these other companies have agreed to go on this journey and make these transformations and the whole thing, it becomes super real to them. Yeah, and, and I think they get, they, they want to move faster. Yep. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us. This was, Thank I you really all. enjoyed it. Safe have travels, safe everybody.